what is going on guys my name is Hussein and this is um, an old but gold article uber engineering switched from postgres to mysql and this article was published on july 26 2016 and uh, uh, this article explains why uber moved from postgres to mysql um Back in the days, I remember that this article got a lot of backlash from the Postgres community and actually the whole database community, uh, to be honest, because of of how the language used in this article severely criticized Postgres as if it's a bad database, right? They don't even mention that thing that they say, hey, by the way, guys, this is just didn't work for us. It doesn't mean it won't work for you. So that's that was the... Uh, that was the main reason this article was heavily criticized. I'm going to reference below this article and the Hacker News um, a thread that explains that they're just going to have a lot of discussions. It's, some discussions go into the deep, some discussions uh, kind of pulling the flaws of this article. But what I want to do in this uh, video slash podcast is going to go through this article and through the main pain point that Uber had and then discuss them give you my personal opinion whether I think uh, Uber moving from Postgres did, did they have to move from Postgres to MySQL or not all of that stuff how about we jump into it guys so guys um, first they explain that their architecture right here um, they have the monolithic backend application written in Python that used Postgres for data persistence and they are moving that again this is 2016 things change and change but they're moving to a microservices architecture and surprisingly to a new system using schemaless it's a novel database sharding layer built on top of mysql so we're going to talk about that a little bit that that just that is a little, little bit of flag you might you might you might say hussein what, what? schemaless and mysql that doesn't make any sense right exactly that's a lot of people confused a lot oh okay why would you pick mysql for schema list just go with with cassandra cockroach db i don't think cockroach db was born back then but but fauna mango right anything but yeah and again they have their own reasons uh and, and that's another article but what i want to focus in here is architecture of postgres as they claim so here's the uh, for the people listening we're reading now the architecture of postgres and i'm gonna read the article the five most pain point that led um, uber to move from postgres to mysql so so this is this is the article now we encountered many postgres limitations the first one in inefficient architecture for writes. The second one, inefficient data replication. The third one, issue with table corruption. Issues with table correction. Issues, not issue. And there's poor, the fourth one, poor replica MVCC, multi-version concurrency control support. And the fifth one is the final one, difficulty upgrading to new releases. I kind of agree with some of them. Because I use Postgres and I know how painful it is to upgrade Postgres, so uh, I kind of relate it to that. I I understand that this is a little bit easier process right now, but nevertheless, how about we? I, I don't agree with all the points, by the way, but I'm just reading out to you. I agree with some of them. Some of them is just to me to preposterous. <laughs> so how about we jump into it? So. They look through the limitation and they decide to move to MySQL because it solves most of these problems. So how about we jumped into one point, uh, one point after another. So the first point here, that's called the on-disk format. And they are describing in this article, in this section, the, the on-disk format of Postgres that implements a multi-version concurrency control. And we talked about it many times in this channel, how the actual uh, indexes are stored, how secondary indexes are stored in, in, in Postgres. How do they implement a multi-version concurrency control using the transaction ID, the TID, right? 
and then max id and min id and how you how a row becomes visible in my transaction and once i go out of scope of the transaction i need to do a vacuum to clean up those uh, rows that need no longer seen by any other transactions so that's all comes comes down to the isolation and all that stuff that we talked about many times this channel so check out the asset video here to learn about isolation asset atomicity i'm not going to explain it right here so th that's that's why i explain here so the what they are going through here is they have a table called users and they're showing you how postgres works so we're for the people listening in the podcast we're looking at the table with four columns id first last and birth year so first name last year name and then birthday and then there's an id is a number first name is a obviously string last name is a string character and then birth year and they show you how this is on disk and there's a, a, a ct id which is which which is a transaction id that is stored that's basically the tuple reference on the disk and this is very very important so these tables are a b c d e f g and so on and so the primary keys they have an index on the primary key which is the id they have a secondary index on the first last and birth year so they have indexes on all of them and again this is just an example they didn't show us their their architecture for security reason probably so they don't they don't show us their scheme and nothing like that but from this example that tells me that they have a lot of indexes so pay attention to that so postgres and their primary key and secondary key always point to the tuple id which is the physical representation on disk right and here's 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 how postgres works so if you now go ahead and update a row any row in this table what we do is we essentially insult insert a duplicate row with a new tuple id this tid right and now that we have a new id we need to point the indexes the secondary indexes and pretty much everything that uses this tuple id to the new representation right and that takes finite amount of time finite amount of rights and finite amount of work for postgres to do right because everything points directly to the disk just like my uh, i uh, my ism uh, isam in my sql that's exactly the same architecture where everything points directly to disk and you might say what's bad about this there's good and bad the bad thing is what they are explaining explaining here is this hey the moment we touch any row i i i have to update all the indexes including the primary key because now all these indexes have a new uh, uh, the, the, those entries have a new id that i need to pick up tuple id so i have to update that and that obviously takes a ripple effect it's called they call it write amplification in the coming slides right and this logical right so i updated a single field in a single row yet it results on five six seven rights physical rights to disk because you're updating this secondary index this secondary index, this second if you have a lot of indexes this even gets slower and slower and slower <laughs> right so bear bear with me here right this is I'm, I'm just explaining their point now so they they go through all of that exactly what i said uh, and uh, that as a result slows things down because first of all rights are not just rights are not slow per se because you you do a flush right you, you have a lot of rights to do and then you do all of them at once but the the side effect of the rights we're going to explain it in a minute it's like one single thing translate to a lot of physical rights I have to update this index this index this index and this index. the right ahead log which is which is something we're going to explain in this article a lot gets large when you when you want to apply these changes so that's the first thing on disk uh, they, they go through the on, on disk representation of postgres then they explain the second point is replication and replication here guys uh, as i discussed the write ahead log is 
basically. If I do an insert, if I do an update, this statement is translated into physical changes. Hey, go to this block and change this location and, and replace this value with this value, right? Or go to this index and change this value to this value. Go to this index on this position, change this. These changes are written in the right ahead log as actual disk changes. Okay, so this is the very, very, very important thing to know. Now, this is the right ahead log. We have this, and, and also the right ahead log is has its its own structure, right? It's somewhere else, and, and it's being maintained. So that's also, the right ahead log also has physical representation on disk when you translate it into an SSD, right? So there is a lot, a lot going on. So now, when you come to replication, which we talked about right here, guys, and also discuss it in my course, Introduction to Database Engineering, the idea of having a primary database, accept the rights, and standby replication for reads that, that you can, that can take reads, you need to push these changes. And the way you push them is, you push the write ahead log, which is a very consistent thing, down the standby databases. So they can get up to date, right? So sounds simple. Enough. And what 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 they explain here in the replication format, and this is where kind of their point about the limitation of Postgres is. You guys have this. First of all, you have this wall right ahead look, which is quite large. Why? Because a single update statement translates into multiple writes, and these writes are made its way to the right ahead log. Hmm. So the word, the right ahead log doesn't have update the stable. It's not like statement based replication. D despite Postgres support st uh, statement based replication through a third party, I believe the MySQL have both supported both st statement based replication and also write based replication. There is again pros and cons for both. So now, when when we try to apply that, came back the dog was barking. All right. So the master database pushes the wall changes down to the standby databases so they can get updated. But you might say, Hussein, what if the standby is actually executing a query? Do this just do we just stop this query? Right? Let's say I'm executing a query in the standby to read something that happened to be deleted in the master and it's being written directly. So I stop the day, do I stop the query? Do I wait? All these questions are gonna get answered in a minute. And as a result, it will shape their decision to move to MySQL. I'm gonna I'm just get I'm gonna explain it to you now. So now they have they we talked about the on desk replicant uh, the on desk representation we talked about replication and now we're going to talk about the consequences of Postgres design that's an, the third point here where the problems of Postgres so let's enjoy this <laughs> reading this the first problem is write amplification and write amplification is, is apparently something is in in SSD where a single write that you think it's logical, translate to many, many, many physical writes, especially in SSD. SSD does its own thing. So when you update versus insert, SSD does a little bit different thing. SSDs love to insert new things. You have to like to logically just insert new things and, and uh, uh, create new pages. SSD does not do well with updates because the goal of SSD is to have a page and flush it. In order to update an existing page, you have to invalidate that existing page. You take it and then you copy it, change it, and then write it. So there is a little bit more work when it comes to an update versus an insert, which is faster. So that's just, that's just, that's all the reason why Google invented the level DB database and then why Facebook invented RocksDB uh, on top of that, I think, 
that to to take advantage of SSDs, and they built a completely different structure called the log structured merge tree, where the, it's it's optimized for inserts instead of updates. Right, so everything is an insert almost in the in the log structure merge tree. So. So that's, that's the idea of write amplification in SSD. Now take that and amplify it at the Postgres level. I, as a client, I'm doing up a single update statement to my table. And if I have like 700 indexes, I just made 700 updates, physical updates, as a result of my single logical update. So that this 700 updates also at the SSD level translate to many, many physical amplified SSD updates because you going rights and pages and SSD poor thing, they have a limited shelf life. So if you have, uh, if you have a limited shelf life at SSD, you can only write so much. I think there is a number that varies between uh, a disk and another, but in general, it's essentially, I think 12,000 times or something like that. That's most of them. So yeah, so they explain this here. I just summarized it to you. Write amplification is a problem for them. So their SSD is getting, is getting uh, their lifespan of SSD is getting lower and lower because of the write amplification because those guys have hundreds and hundreds of indexes. Why would you have this much indexes? Beats me. Do you really query on all of them? Do you really query on first name, right, or last name? That's why adding indexes is great. Adding too much indexes is just a bad idea. So that's the right amplification problem. The second problem they want to discuss here is, is the replication problem. Guys, take the same thing that we did. We did a single update that translated to lots of update to all the indexes because all of the indexes point to the row directly so and the row ch id changes so we have to make them aware of this row changes so all of these indexes point to the row directly so these changes are, are just amplified now these changes translate to what to a wall right right ahead log Hey, update this physical index and this index and this second index and this, this. And by the way, there is a row here, change this value to this. And there is an digit. It's all physical right to the disk. What they complain about in their application says this wall translates to a large, big sized bandwidth when it comes to, to their, to their master uh, worker or standby replication and those are interstate they they have their replica replicas across states across different countries so they had to buy expensive bandwidth to kind of transmit their wall changes from this replica to this replica and, and I believe they have also child, grandchild replication. So take that into consideration. So the wall changes as they grow large, the bandwidth ex is, becomes expensive because they are very large. And they're not making small updates. They're making large updates, which tonight says they're even larger. So that's, that, that's the limitation problem here. In case of, I'm going to read this, this section for you guys so, um, so you can learn more about it. In case when where Postgres replication happens purely within a single data center, the replication bandwidth may not be a problem. Modern network equipment and switches can handle a large amount of bandwidth, and many host providers offer free or cheap intra-data center bandwidth. Right. If you are internally, I can transfer one gig of wall sizes easily. However, when replication must happen between data centers, issues can quickly escalate. For instance, Uber originally used a physical servers in colocation co space. I don't know what, what the heck is a colocation. Colocation space on the West Coast. For disaster recovery purposes, we added servers in the in second East Coast colocation space. Uh, in this design, we had a master Postgres instance plus replicas in Western data center and set of replication in Eastern one. So that, that kind of con the constraint you can see from east to west just 
just did, did not scale for them, right? Because of that, see one how one single problem can lead to a lot of bigger problems, can lead to another problem. Do you, you see the pattern, guys? Rights are big because they have a lot of indexes. That's where you should start. Why do you have this much indexes? <laughs> you might say, hey, Hussein, I cannot live. I have to have 350 indexes on all my fields because I query against them. Well, in this case, I was like, okay, maybe that's not a choice for you then. But try to avoid that in the first place. That's That's what I... That's what I didn't see, and that's why people are pissed. It's like, wow, can didn't did you really ex, didn't you explain why do you guys have a lot of indexes? Can you explain why do you need? I bet if you go into the actual architecture, most things don't need this much indexes. As a result, you will not translate to a, a huge uh, right amplification consequences. You will not have that because you'll not have a lot of, of indexes to update, right? But, well, we, we're not an Uber, so we don't know their architecture, but that might be a valid use case. So let's go to the data corruption. This is the, this is the most um, dumb section in this whole article. I'll save you some time. What they say here is, hey, during the replication, we Postgres 9.2 had a bug in it, and we, our, our table were, was corrupted as a result. Seriously? Seriously, Uber? What software doesn't have bugs? You're adding a bug as a result to move from Postgres to a MySQL? Like MySQL is perfect? That's just odd. That's just, to me, I'm sorry, that's just odd. So they said during during the replication process, the replicas were not in sync for some reason. And as a result, when you query for, for a unique value, let's say select star from users where ID equal four, you should get one, right? They were getting two. They were getting the old retired row for some, for some reason, right? And that causes their application to, to, to fall down and then fall apart. So they had to add defensive programming and then to catch for this stuff, but it's a bug. Postgres immediately, if, if they notified Postgres team, they would immediately have fixed it and, and fixed that bug immediately. But that's a good bug, but I don't see bugs as a reason to move from as a kind of showstopper, in my opinion. So that's, they talk about that, and they talk about here, one section is the B3 rebalancing, which is, by the way, by the way, B3 rebalancing adds to the right amplification. I just, they don't mention that, but it's just impl implied because a lot of people know that. When you insert, 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 insert to, to a row, and you have a lot of indexes, you keep updating those indexes. Naturally, if, you, if your value touches that index, right? However, as a result of inserting, that might, the B3 structure might need to rebalance itself. And when it needs to rebalance itself, it actually doesn't update, physical update to the tree. And updates are updates, not inserts, right? So updates translate to what? to actual SSD write amplifications because SSD do not like updates. So that's that's another thing that can amplify the writes. I'm talking if you go to the millions of uh, rows, right, obviously. Right, let's move to the next one. Replica MVCC. All right, Replica MVCC or Replica Multi-Version Concurrency Control. It says, Postgres does not have true replica on VCC. Well, why? Because the, the fact that replicas apply wall updates directly, right? Because if you think about it, Postgres, by default, again, by default, I say by default, takes the on-disk representation of the wall changes, and that's what gets transmitted. So it's often higher bandwidth but it's if you think about it it's faster right the alternative is 
just do statement-based replication, right? Where, where instead of sending the results of the execution of the queries, send the queries themselves. Like, hey, I just did an insert. I just did an update. I just did an... So the actual string of the statements, the SQL statement, just send them to the replica. This will be way slower, right? Because, yeah, the bandwidth of chain transmitting these wall changes as as form of statement is smaller than the actual physical changes that happen. However, applying them to the replica, now you have to actually, inserts are not, straightforward inserts might be okay, but what if you do an update, for example? An update could scan, could touch the index, actually does work. So you did double the work technically, right? Because you did the work to execute the statement on the master. You now are doing the same work exactly. And, th and that, if that statement is expensive, you're going to take the same cost on the server and the, 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 the destination. So there is a pros and cons for using both. But they're complaining here that Postgres wall update is just uh, doesn't give them MVCC support. So let's, let's claim that. So let's say if I am... If I am in a replica standby and I'm executing a query and one of my wall changes affects that query that is being executed on the standby. So, okay, I have a master. I am, I deleted, let's say I deleted a table. That's just a little bit harsh, but let's say I deleted a few rows, right? And now on the, on the standby, I'm actually querying those rows that is being deleted on the master. I am on a different replica. So now I am pushing the master, pushing the wall changes to the, to the standby while that query that is querying those deleted rows is being executed. What should Postgres do? You, you tell me as the viewer, listener, what, should, what do you think should happen here? Should the Postgres immediately cancel the query, right, and and write the changes, or should the should the wall changes be paused until the query finishes? <laughs> if you think about, it, there are no other choices, right? You have to pause it. Obviously, you're not pausing all wall changes. You're only pausing changes that affect running transaction, and that's another thing to worry about how the heck do i know that the query that being executed actually affects my wall changes building databases is not easy guys look at all this complexity so they're complaining here that you guys don't have MV vcc support because what you're doing is what postgres does effectively is essentially having a timeout it says hey we're going we're gonna to block the wall changes for a given timeout, and they give you this timeout configurable. If the query didn't finish in this amount of time, we're sorry, we're going to cancel those changes. We're going to cancel the query that is actually querying, it's reading, and while we're applying, we're going to force applying the changes. Why? Because Postgres design uh, favor eventual consistency over let's say just reading queries right in this case right so i rather be eventually consistent remember eventually this is eventually consistent consistent as well so stop saying that no is the only database has eventual consistency every database has it as long as between replicas right <laughs> relational doesn't in the same 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 instance yeah it's completely consistent but across replicas there is always this idea of eventual consistency so what Postgres does is actually kills the transaction, and they did not like that. <laughs> so guys, let, let's read this a little bit. I, I, I kind of don't, don't agree with this statement, right? The design means that replicas can routine, routinely lag seconds behind master, obviously, and therefore it is easy to write code that results in kill transactions. Hmm. What does that mean? This problem might not be apparent to the application developer writing code that obscure where the transactions start on M. For instance, say a developer has some code that has to email or receive to a user, depending on how it's written, the code may implicitly have a 
database transaction that held open until the email finishes to send it. That's just a bad idea, right? You don't have, you don't hold, you don't hold a transaction open and you do stuff has nothing to do with the transaction itself. Try to avoid that as much as possible. So that's just, that's just a best, best practice. While it's always bad form uh, to let your code hold open database transaction while performing unrelated blocking I old okay thank thankfully they mentioned that the reality is that most engineers are not database expert and may not always understand this problem I have to disagree with this one again guys uh, if you if you if you have if you have seen if you if you know me from this channel or the podcast you know that war as an engineer you have to take pride of your work and the thing that you interface with I believe that you have to understand what you're communicating with so y- yeah engineers are not database expert but this does not qualify as a database expert this is just basic transaction management in my opinion right and and, and i believe engineers have to understand this right and engineers have to understand if, if you you don't, you might be not as radical as as me i don't like to work with anything that i don't understand if it's black box, I don't like to work with it. I, before I pick a tool, I have to understand fully how it actually works. Fully, fully, from zero to 100%. If I'm, if I'm working on it, if I'm connecting with it, if I'm interfacing with it, it's okay if I understand 80, 70% of the tool, right? But again, I'm not going to understand every single thing in that case, right? But that's just me. You might have a different opinion. Postgres upgrades. So I, mean, I kind of agree with them on this one. I, I try to upgrade Postgres many times and always didn't find the right tutorial or it was so complicated that I gave up, right? And they kind of reiterate the same problem. So, but I had to agree with them 100% on this. Postgres upgrade is, is really painful, really painful. I've, I've been there. I've been there from 9.3 to 9.4, 9.4 to 9.5. I then just gives up. I, I just rather recreate my databases from scratch <laughs> after that. Obviously, I'm running a test database here, but but yeah, I didn't run a production da- database that I had to upgrade it. But what I'm going to do in this case is just obviously there is a way, but apparently this way sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't. So there is a there is there is also the PG logical way of right. Uh, I think there's there are some tools that allow you to do upgrades, right? And um, guys, if you if you know any of that stuff, if you if you have ever upgraded Postgres database smoothly, let me know in the po- in the comment section below. I'd love to know how to do it. I I tried twice, I believe, and I gave up and says, you know what, this is not straightforward. I don't. And I didn't have, I wasn't forced to do it. So I took the easy route of recreating my data. Okay, the architecture of MySQL. <laughs> AnuDB. AnuDB. We talked about AnuDB, guys. Check out the video right here if you want to learn more about it. But AnuDB, what they, so they go now through their own disk representation compared to Postgres. So AnuDB or, or just MySQL in general. MySQL or NUDB in general, that's the right way of saying it. They have the primary key. And the primary key has a pointer to the row directly to the physical database on the scroll. All the indexes that you create points back to the primary key. And that's the powerful thing here for them. Because now, if I update anything on, on, the, on the row, only the primary key needs to be updated to know the new kind of raw id and even that right it's it's a little bit different but i I don't have to touch to touch my secondary indexes right that being said guys they didn't uh, that's not always true if you're updating a field that has no index then right you're gonna not touch only the primary key but if you updated a field that has an index you gotta touch both so they didn't mention that, but yeah, right. Because it's very defensive uh, article, right? MySQL is perfect. Yeah, if you update the, the, the actual field that has a secondary index, you have to update the secondary index. You just updated a value. So you have to go to your index and, and change the tree so that includes this value, right? So yeah, you touch a lot of fields, right? 
and if you touch a lot of fields, yeah, then you have to update all the indexes, right? It's just by design, it's less. If you have a lot of indexes, you have less changes in general, right? So as a result, this translates to obviously less uh, less raw wall changes because they don't have as much changes logical to physical translation. And now they talk about the uh, rollback mechanism here that in MySQL, they have this concept of rollback segments. So instead of inserting a row in the heap itself, uh, when you update a data, uh, a row in a Postgres, you insert a row in the heap itself, in the table itself, right? MySQL and, and AnnoDB does it differently. It's just they, they copy the row into some other place called the undo, the rollback segments, the undo logs, right? And they keep it all there. And then based on that, they point to that location in the rollback segments. All right, so so they, it's a little bit different architecture. So if you query now, if you want the latest, the latest is always there. So that's the beautiful thing. But based on your transaction ID, if you are coming from the past, you are querying in the past, you want older results, you have to do the jump to go back to, to get the older done. This jump doesn't exist in Postgres. So queries that that are concurrent are faster in Postgres, they are technically slower and in, in MySQL because now you have to jump back and go through different places to do to do the query, right? And uh, and vice versa. So they, they explain that, hey, secondary indexes point to the primary index and the primary index point to the disk. This is for people listening on the podcast. We're listening, uh, we're watching, <laughs> we're listening, we're looking at a, at a picture of secondary index pointing to the primary index and then primary index is pointing to the disk. Right, that's just an extra layer. And then they claim that, uh, they say here that the replication section of MySQL supports multiple replication mode, statement-based and wall changes. And the moment you, if you implement, uh, if you implement any of these modes, if you implement statement-based replication, you have true MVC support because now the statement the, the wall changes that coming that is coming to you from the master to the standby is just another write. They consider it another transaction trying to be executed. So it will have truly true MVCC support in that case. It will not be blocking, right? Because you can technically query and write at the same time. And now as a result, you can implement the same exact thing that you're doing. Right, because you have logical view of what is changing. As a result, the database is aware of the change. It can implement MVCC at the higher level, right? Even through replication. Postgres does support that. There is a third party that you can install and does exactly that. You can do that. It's just they they just didn't mention that. Oh, again, guys, this is an old article, so things can change, obviously. All right. In MySQL. Uh, and they they say that oh by the way all, even the wall the wall sizes the wall sizes are so small because we're changing uh, we're changing very few things here they go through all of that stuff again I'm not gonna go through that but that's essentially their advantages they go through another advantage here of, of MySQL saying that a buffer pool the buffer pool is the caching mechanism in Postgres compared to uh, but buffer pool is the caching mechanism in in MySQL compared to the caching mechanism in Postgres, which is which is basically the RSS memory, right? And uh, they they're explaining the difference here. They 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 claim that Postgres using uses a different uh, operating uh, operating system calls, like they're using two calls instead of one. I don't know much about that, to be honest. I'm not an expert in operating systems. But a lot of people say that, yeah, you have to use a one call to seek and read at the same time instead of seeking and reading. I don't know. Maybe Postgres actually changes. A lot of people here uh, listening and watching this channel, some some people actually are experts in this thing and m might correct that part. But I'm not aware of that uh, as a result. So I can't comment more much on that part. There is then uh, the NODB storage engine implements the least recently used uh, buffer pool and which you can have apparently control. I'm surprised that you cannot control the cache size on Postgres. I need to read more about that a little bit. 
But that's another thing they, they said, oh, this is another advantage of MySQL. Then another thing says uh, the connection handling. In, Post in MySQL, there's a thread pair connection. Each TCP connection to you open to MySQL is a thread on the server side. However, Postgres, it's an actual process. So technically now, they, they claim obviously in, the, in a, th a thread is cheaper to spin off than a process. I read, I read that this is no longer true because a process and a thread is almost identical now. But could be back in the days, could be that that was true. But now, if you think about it, to scale ten thousand connections right now, if you think about it, opening opening a lot of TCP connections is just a bad idea. So that's that's why we have the idea of connection pooling, right? We build our application so they use as a pool, reserve a pool, reverse reserve a connection from the pool execute the transaction and then return it to the pool right and if you have you're doing a single atomic trans uh statement that executed you can just execute on the pool directly say hey pick any pool any instance in the pool execute and then return return it immediately right this reserve and release is also back to their queries if they have a queries that span three four five seven minutes and again Nothing wrong with a query that that transaction that stands long, if you're actually doing all database works. Some 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 transaction I've seen transaction that takes thirty minutes just because it does a lot of work. It, it changes a lot of stuff, and these changes has to be atomic, right? Yeah, you can argue that you can break it. Even that, you can, you have to break these transaction into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller pieces so that each piece can be executed in its own atomic manner, right? So you can minimize the transaction size. So this this also results in if you have a long running transactions, then you have to really think about how do the reservation and connection pooling works, right? So the number of connection, right, think about it so that if if no if a client's not is not using a connection, then don't let them open a connection and just have it open. Use connection pooling. And they say they, they use, a, I believe, PG Bouncer. Is that what they're using? Some some service that actually does that, that connection pooling. But a lot of applications do it. Even if you don't, you can build your own layer on top. And I showed uh, connection pooling on Postgres many times in this channel. Right? So that's the idea, guys. And uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully in the future, uh, this we're we're uh, we're at the end of the article, obviously, guys. Right? We're at the end of the article, but hopefully, w when it comes to connection pooling, I really hope that Quick as a protocol and Mask, I believe that they're just working on a new protocol right now. It's called Mask that will allows you to kind of stream multiple to open multiple streams on a given TCP connection or UDP connection in the case of Quick that represents your your uh, your database connection so that if 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 MySQL or Postgres supported Quick and I don't see a reason why not then the client can open a single and remember the client is always a web server or something like that right so go open a single connection and have up to 200 even more than that streams concurrently in a single TCP connection. The only trick here is the database has to understand the idea of streams. So that's a lot of work, but I believe it's gonna be really lucrative for a database to implement a, a, a protocol like that. Just like I don't really need TCP anymore, right? A single TCP, it's just a wasteful thing to have a single TCP connection for a given client right or connection pooling this has to go away and we have to move to a model where we multiplex queries in a single tcp connection using this protocol right whether it's whether you're using even if they implemented their own they don't have to use quick you just implement and your own protocol that supports multiplexing through multiplexing so that every request every session Every channel has a, its own logical representation in that TCP connection that you open. So this, so you don't have to open many connections. You just have to open one or few of them, and each one of them has uh, 
basically some limit. Obviously, that doesn't come with it f for free because now you just increase the CPU size at the back end and the front end because now you have to assemble these channels and streams. That's the problem with HTTP2 and quick. Uh, people start uh, Lucas Perdue and 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 uh, what's his name, Chris Wood, and people working on the Quick protocol, they're trying to solve this problem with the CPU usage, <laughs> right? Because CPU usage, now you have, to, you're just not working with just stream of content coming from the TCP socket. No, you have to actually look at the data and then arrange the packets so they are in logical streams or channels and then, then deliver it to the app. So the operating system or the application, wherever this thing lives, doing extra work so again i'm sorry about that segue but i want to discuss that a little bit i think i think that's just an idea that is just great conclusion obviously they say hey postgres served, served us well in the early days of uber but we ran into significant problems scaling postgres with our growth today we have some legacy postgres instances but the bulk of our databases are either on top of mysql typically using our schema list layer. That's another point. You have, you have now schema list. You have schema list and using MySQL. Maybe there is something I'm missing here, but it does not seem natural to me. A lot of people use uh, Postgres to, as a schema list layer where they put a hunk of JSON in a single field as json b and they 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 work with that but maybe that that's just the way for uber because if they have a lot of fields and they have a lot of indexes on those fields maybe that's the way to go who knows right i again guys what do you think what do you think about all that stuff let me know in the comment section below i'm gonna see you in the next one hope you enjoyed this video give it a like if you do and share it with your friends i'm gonna see you in the next one Thank you, Ivan Kiltiz, Kilt, Kiltiziki, a staff engineer and Uber engineer. This is a great article again. Yeah, and uh, things uh, things has been changing a lot in the in the Uber world. But this is again, this is a this is a historical article that goes in the years and years, and uh, we had to discuss it. So, thank you so much. Appreciate you. I'm gonna see you in the next one. You guys stay awesome.